Welcome to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I'm Donnie Deutsch. And um, a little bit about this show, if you're a first-time listener, the premise of the show is that everybody, everything, every institution, every religion, every company, every product is a brand today. And I'm here to break down the brands that are shaping who we are, where we're going, what we're doing, the brands of the week that are really kind of dictating what's going on in the world and where we're headed. And every week I have an iconic brand myself on the show, an individual that we break down their brand and they give us their views on so much of what's going on in the world. First, let's get to my brands of the week. Uh, this is what we do every week. We go over a bunch of brands that are kind of making a difference in the world, shaping the zeitgeist. And this could be a person, it can be an institution, a religion, a, a political party, a, an athlete, but the brands and their essences that are shaping the brand of the week. And I remind everybody what a brand is. A brand is a set of values. A brand could be anything. And let's get into the brands of the week. First up, U.S. Army. Big brand up for the U.S. Army. They just launched a recruitment ad, an animated commercial about a girl named Emma, who's gay, who's a lesbian, and was brought up by two women. And the commercial shows her going to her mom's weddings and marching gay pride parades. And what a world it is right now that we have the U.S. Army recruiting ad uh, for lesbians. I mean, just how great is that? I mean, think about that 10, 20, 30 years ago. And obviously, they've done their research, and that, that's a big target audience for them. But big, big thumbs up, big brand up for the Army. Great commercial with Emma. Uh, recruiting gay young women, and uh, what a beautiful, beautiful world we've become. Second brand of the week is TV comedies. TV comedies are way brand down, and here's why, what's interesting. NBC announced their fall lineup, and in seven nights, this is for the coming season, coming fall season, there's not one comedy. I want you to think about that. This is NBC. This is the, the network of Cheers and Friends and Seinfeld and Cosby and uh, just, you know, iconic comedies. And yet on network television, one of the major networks, next full season will not have one comedy. Well, what does that say? What does that say about the brand of comedies and situation? You know, we used to call them situation comedies when I was growing up. And it's kind of a dying breed. They're going to be some, of course. I'm going to talk about one in a little bit while. But the main reason is that people can get their comedies bespoke, obviously, on streaming. You know, you, there's so many comedic performances you can watch anywhere on any streaming services. There's so many different slices and dices that these kind of broad stroke comedies, if you will, comedies that have to have such a broad audience they can appeal on network television, just are going out, out you know, going the way of, of uh, the, the Etzel. It's, it's incredible. You know, if you look at the fall lineup for NBC, it's you got one entire night of of uh, Dick Wolf show, two nights of Dick Wolf shows. One is um, uh, Law and Order, an entire night of three episodes. Another one is an entire night of Chicago and Chicago PD, Chicago Fire. So it's these procedural shows that are driving network television as network television ages. So basically a big brand down for comedies and TV overall, with the exception, we're going to do one brand up for The Wonder Years. The Wonder Years is coming back on ABC. Now, The Wonder Years is an amazing show from the, I guess it was the 90s, um, could have been the 80s, yeah, the 90s. And it was from the eyes of a 12-year-old boy looking back to when in the late 60s he was growing up and it was starring Fred Savage. It was narrated by a grown-up Fred Savage as was uh, Daniel Stern was narrating the show. And now they're bringing it back from the perspective of a young black boy growing up in Alabama in the late 60s. So it's obviously gonna have a prism of growing up uh, as a young African-American in this country and obviously uh, uh, and narrated by Don Cheadle. So sometimes there's really fresh ways to reboot things. So we're going to give a big brand up for Wonder Years, although the entire category of comedies gets a big brand down. Next brand of the week, huge way up. And she, this is her second week, is Liz Cheney. Uh, Liz Cheney, of course, well-documented, was thrown aside by the Republican Party uh, because she's one of the few that says, guess what? The election was fair and would not subscribe to the big lie or the big lie, as I branded last week, as a failed attempt to overthrow U.S. democracy. Um, Huge, 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 huge uh, brand up for her. It is just a stunning thing, which just takes us right into the Republican Party, which I brand, branded last week. Our brand again, the party of loser. But the stunning thing is when you look at the numbers on, on Liz Cheney, that that 70 percent of people in the Republican Party said she represents the wrong values of the Republican Party, whereas 67 percent of the Republican Party believe that uh, Joe Biden was illegitimately elected. So those two numbers kind of sync up. And what else do you need to know about the Republican Party? And once again, Liz Cheney hero, Republican Party, big zero. 89% of the Republican Party thinks Trump's economic views are right. 88% think his immigration views are great. 79% of the Republican Party believes the way he treats media is great. And this is the Republican Party. And they're going to go down with him, as I said last week. But big thumbs up, big brand up to Liz Cheney. Next one is Miss Universe. This is going to be a little, little controversial, and I want to make sure I get it across clearly because I'm going to take some crap from this. But 
Now, a brand down for Miss Universe. And what happened in Miss Universe came back this year after being gone for the pandemic. And Miss Universe is kind of a dated concept to begin with. They, tr- there was, what showed up in Miss Universe was a lot of, pub, you know, political statements in, in terms of they were in, introducing it. And, you know, but a lot of the women had, you know, holding signs and that's fun. But sometimes political statements and, you know, even the right political statements in the wrong environment, in the wrong tone, can diminish them a little bit. For instance, you had Miss Singapore coming out and there's an announcer and she comes out and she's strutting out. And this is exactly the way the announcer did it. He goes, this is from Miss Universe, goes, Singapore is a place for all races and they are very proud to be Asian. It sure would be great to stop Asian hate in Singapore. And then she's got a big cape that says stop Asian hate. Almost like a sport, like, Obviously, the message is the right message, and we've got to get message out about stuff. But when sometimes it can get trivialized, when it's almost done in a, as I said, this could have been wrestling, you know. I'm sure it would be great to stop Asian hate in Singapore. And their big cape opens up, stop Asian hate. And it's such a serious message. And sometimes as political messages get into the into the popular culture, we've got to make sure they have the same, the, the, the proper gravitas surrounding them and not to trivialize them. So- I'm sure this won't be all, or, you know, universally popular, what I said, but the tone, the message was right. We got to get the tone right at the same time also. Um, next brand for the week. Big brand up for Steve Kornacki. Now, if a lot of you, uh, I'm sure, know Steve Kornacki. Uh, Steve Kornacki is a colleague of mine from MSNBC. He's the guy, the very cool, nerdy guy who you see up there uh, on election nights in front of the, you know, the big screen boards that give all the totals to the elections. And he became a hero this last election because for five nights straight, he was up there like Rain Man, where every digit, every number, every county that was getting counted, it was like somehow he had a brain that you, how is he processing all this and getting this across to us? You're expecting his head to explode, but he became a real celebrity out of it. He wears khakis and um, Gap, uh, you know, khaki sales went way through the roof. And what's happening with Steve Kornacki now is that NBC realized there's something to this guy and they're going to be, there's going to be a Steve Kornacki game show, a game show about statistics and politics and sports. He loves politics. And I think that's just a really interesting celebration of Steve Kornacki. You know, already NBC has put him into sports. You're going to see him on football. But this is a celebration of the nerd. Of uh, And it's just a really interesting thing that this guy who's politically up there just talking about stats all of a sudden is going to have his own game show. So big brand up for Steve Kornacki. Big brand down for Facebook. You know, uh, 44 uh, bipartisan lawyers got together and, and, and wrote letters to um, Mark Zuckerberg, of course, the owner of, uh, not the owner, the, the, the founder and the leader of Facebook that owns Instagram, they're coming out with an Instagram for children. I want to say that again. Instagram for children under the age of 13. Let's come up with an Instagram aimed at nine-year-olds. You fucking kidding me? You know, anybody that knows, that, that has kids knows how difficult it is for kids to navigate social media, that the cyberbullying that goes on, that on Instagram, you've got to see everybody else's curated, perfect lives. You know, and your life supposedly sucks because everybody else's life looks so much better. And we're going to put this out there for really young kids. Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, probably my biggest brand down for the week goes to Facebook and Instagram, coming out with Instagram for kids. Put that one away, please. Big brand up for Marv Albert. Marv Albert retiring from as a play-by-play uh, NBA announcer at uh, 80 years old. Uh, you've been, you see him on TNT. Uh, he was, when I grew up listening to him call the Knicks. And what was so important about his brand is that he basically made sports casting Gave, made it entertaining. You know, he had his famous thing for the Knicks when they would hit a basket, go, yes. And now we have all the kind of sports casters with their shticks. And I don't mean shticks in the bad sense of the word, but why he was so iconic was that he elevated the game of, of, of sports casting. It wasn't just a serious play by play, put personality into it, and made every guy that played, that sat next to him, every color guy, every color woman that sat next to him better. He upped everybody else's game. Class gentleman, big brand up for Marv Albert. McDonald's. Big brand up. McDonald's uh, this past week raised their minimum wage for their lower end workers, for their entry level workers, for the night shift workers from $11 to $15 and $17 to $21. And, you know, a lot of people in the business world say, oh, well, the one problem with raising minimum wages is that uh, it's going to hurt the businesses and the stock price. No, McDonald's stock price did just fine. I actually think that the companies that understand this and understand that when you have valued employees, they work harder and then you get better customers. And also when you put money into the system, in the case of these fast food workers, it's going into their communities, more money to spend. And I I, I think beyond the right thing to do, it's going to end up being good business. So I think it's bullshit that it's bad for a stock price when any of these companies raise the minimum wage. So big brand up for McDonald's. Um, 
Ellen, the Ellen brand. Ellen uh, it announced that she's retiring after 19 seasons. And I think the Ellen brand is really tarnished. And, you know, she said it's not fun anymore. It's not a challenge. And a, a lot of it probably has to do, I believe, with it came out in the last year that um, it was a very toxic work environment there. Uh, took a lot of heat. And having run a business, I know that once a story gets to the point where it's it was such a, you know, it, this was not just on a blog. This was in major periodicals talking about the workplace and you weren't allowed to look at Ellen and things like that. And that stuff doesn't get out when the smoke this fire. And it, what bothers me so much about that is that it was so counter to what her public brand, you know, the nice person next door, the most likable person in the world. And here we have that behind the scenes, there's a toxic work environment. And that, you know, that kind of pisses me off. It really does. You know, I remember reading about Letterman and Letterman, you couldn't look at him and well, but Letterman never presented himself to be anything but kind of a, a jerk in his day. And he's since talked and come out and how he, you know, he, he found antidepressants and it really, really changed it. But what bothers me about the Ellen brand is that it was like, so yay, look how wonderful I am. And yet we found out there was a toxic environment. And so a, a definitely blemish brand going into the future. She'll have another year, but Ellen is saying goodbye. Another tarnished brand, Bill Gates. Wow. You know, what's come out, obviously, last couple of weeks, they announced he's divorced. But what's come out recently is that some inappropriate things in the workplace, and most importantly and most troubling is his relationship with Jer Jeffrey Epstein. Of course, Jeffrey Epstein is the, since uh, he's dead, uh, the pedophile that supposedly kills himself in prison. But, uh, you know, I obviously have a lot of questions about that. But that Bill Gates, post-2013, post when, when he had already been convicted of— uh, child, you know, sexual abuse charges um, that Bill Gates was still hanging out with him. Well, I, 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 you're the second, first wealthiest guy in the world. You, you have this huge foundation. You're, you're an icon. And this is, you, you can't figure out that you shouldn't be spending time with a convicted pedophile. I, I, I mean, unfortunately, and Bill Gates has done so many great things. And Microsoft is part of our culture right now. And Bill Gates is, you know, goes down as one of the smartest guys in history. And to have this blemish, it, it's a shame, but it's there. And, and talk about judgment. Talk about poor judgment. You're Bill Gates, man. So on uh, Microsoft lived on. Bill Gates will go down in history as somebody who changed the world, but with a real blemish on the brand there. And those are our brands of the week. I also want to just add on a new, new segment to our brands of the week where it's called Brand Forward. It's really brand predictions where every week I make a, a prediction or two or three about what's going to happen with the brand. And I want to this week make our brand prediction about our brand forward about Liz Cheney. And I talked earlier, she's one of the brands of the week, but why I'm going to put her in the brand forward section is the irony is she got tossed out by the Republican Party. But what's going to happen, and here's my brand prediction, in the year 2024, she's going to be a third party candidate. She will run for president. And this has been talked about a little bit, not a lot, but, and she will cost the Republicans the election. I, they'll lose either way. But with her in there as a third party, slicing four or five or six or seven or eight percent of the vote, they have no chance. So, the irony and the stupidity of the Republicans is that she is going to be their downfall again in the next election. So brand prediction, brand forward, Liz Cheney, presidential candidate 2024, nail in the coffin for the Republican. And that's our brands of the week and that's our brand forward. And now it's time for our sit down with Don Lemon. Here we go. My guest today, uh, I don't want to say needs no introduction because we introduce everybody, but he's, he's kind of an icon at this point. Uh, if you have anything to do with news or, or watch cable TV or have uh, been paying attention to the world, which most of us do, uh, you know him. He's Don Lemon. Um, he anchors the uh, 10 o'clock slot on um, CNN every night. He's got a new book, This is the Fire, What I Say to My Friends About Racism. Uh, he's a compelling guy. Um, and I, you're going to really, really enjoy his interview. He, he's a very important guy in our culture right now. And so here's my interview with Don Lemon. Well, I, I'm thrilled at today's guest. Uh, he's a very important guy in this country right now. I would say one of the most influential people around. And as we get into a discussion, you'll see why. He, he's a friend of mine. He is the host of uh, CNN Tonight every night at 10 o'clock. He's got a, a barn burner new book, This is the Fire, What I Say to My Friends About Racism. And he's a friend of mine. And his name is Don Lemon. Don, welcome to On Brand. Thank you for having me, Donnie. This is indeed a pleasure. I've made the big time now. No, yeah, really. I, I got a little. <laughs> I got a little personal bone to pick with you before we start. And you might not remember okay. this, but this has left a social scar on me. And you really, you really screwed up my game a bunch of uh -oh. years ago. You were. You, oh my god. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. We we haven't. I need to confront this now. I've, I've, in my <laughs> in, through my therapy, I've gotten much better at talking things through and getting things out. And a number of years ago, you were at a lunch at my house out east. I know that sounds very whatever, but and there was a bunch of people there, and Christy Brinkley was there. 
And I was, I had just filmed a thing with Christy and we, I thought we had a little thing going on. I was trying, going to take her out, but she came for lunch. I thought a group thing was first. And we got into this group, very intense group discussion and you were kind of leading it. And it was about the blurry lines between a gay man and a straight man and that that a guy, a straight guys <laughs> have, all have the gay gene. And it ended up by the end where Christy somehow thought I was gay and I, it was over for me at that point. Now, this is something I've lived with I would like either from you a I'm sorry or here's what you didn't understand or you had no shot with Christy anyway. I just, for a cathartic moment, I need to wrap this up. Uh, well, I mean, that was a lot of rosé that day. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't re- exactly remember the conversation, but I mean, it was just, we were having, we were talking about, okay, let's, but there were two gay men, other gay men, a couple right, at right. the thing and Christy and you were, and we got into this conversation about the kids, young kids now, fluidity, blah, yeah. blah, blah. But I don't know how it got to, you know, <laughs> got to question, end up that, question that it my was section. Donnie. Maybe because you were the only heterosexual maybe man there. there. Maybe because I was, was sitting on one of the guy's laps. I mean, maybe anything, oh, uh, anything could have been, you know. Well, Jonathan Wall was there, too, yes. so maybe you were the only heterosexual <laughs> man there. But- <laughs> we, Jonathan, we're kidding about that. Jonathan actually, it's yeah. so the way Don and I met. John was, was a, a Don's first EP. Uh, he was my showrunner. Brilliant, He's the brilliant man. production uh, executive uh, who's at MSNBC now. All right, I want to talk to you guys about Audible. Now, a lot of you may know this, and Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. At Audible, you can find the largest selection of audio books ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, languages, business, motivation, and more like original ent- entertainment from top celebrity creators and thousands of popular and binge-worthy podcasts. Look, as an auto member, you get one credit every month, good for any title in our entire premium selection. That means the latest bestseller, the buzziest new release, the hottest celebrity memoir, or that bucket list title you're meaning to pick up. Those titles are yours to keep forever in your Audible library. You also get full access to our popular Plus catalog. It's filled with thousands and thousands of audiobooks, original entertainment, guided fitness and meditation, sleep tracks for better rested podcasts, including all ad-free versions of your favorite shows and exclusive series. All are included with your membership, so you can download and stream all you want. No credits needed. You can always find the perfect title for whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, or wherever you're feeling. Whether it's comedy, romance, suspense, true crime, science fiction, fitness, and wellness. With everything you love to listen to all in one app, Audible is your playlist for life. New members can always try Audible for 30 days on us. Visit audible.com slash Donnie or text Donnie to 500-500. That's audible.com slash Donnie or text Donnie to 500-500. I want to talk to you guys about NetSuite. And you got to get NetSuite. It's that simple if you got a business or it, it, because if you're still running your business on QuickBooks, QuickBooks, more like quicksand, the bigger your company grows, the faster you sync with outdated software that just can't keep up. You need NetSuite. Look, you don't have time to start dealing with, and with manual processes, multiple systems, delays, and scrambling to get the numbers you need. It's time to get on solid ground. And that solid ground is by, with NetSuite by Oracle, the scalable solution to run all of your key back office operations, no matter how big your company grows. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more, everything you need to grow in all in one place. And NetSuite helps you automate your key business processes and close your books in a fraction of the time. Think days, not weeks. In fact, 93% of surveyed organizations increase visibility and control over their business since making the switch from QuickBooks to NetSuite. Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program only for those ready to graduate from QuickBooks. Head to netsuite.com slash Donnie. That's special financing for you graduates at netsuite.com slash Donnie. netsuite.com slash Donnie. All right, Don, the way I start the show all the time is, you know, the premise of the show is that everybody, everything is a brand, every institution, every religion, you're a brand, uh, every celebrity. Every, tell me what you, what you think the Don Lemon brand is. Wow. Wow, that's a great question, Donnie. Thanks. I, I don't. I know you think everyone is a brand. Yes, and sometimes that um, that name um, really gives me angst because I, you know, people always talk about their brand and their branding and what they are. I think I'm just an authentic, outspoken guy who likes to tell the truth. I'm a truth teller, mm-hmm. and I like to challenge people. As you opened up this uh, podcast by saying, I like to challenge people about their beliefs. Um, where they think they stand in society and the world and who they are. So uh, a truth teller and someone who pushes the envelope. And I like to think that I push the culture along as well. Yeah, I want to just, as the brand, the guy, I want to add to that. Or, or, you know, you are, I would say, in, in that you are uh, an inf- influential black anchor in America today that is not only reporting the news and giving your opinion, but in certain ways is calling out racism and 
healing at the same time. And you, you have this very unique spot in our culture right now, right now. Well, thank you for that. The one thing that I would, a correction that I would make, and you can, you know, whatever you want to think about it. I, I don't think I give my opinion. I, I like to say I give my point of view. Okay. Because point of view, my point of view is based in fact and in truth. And sometimes opinion is not. And uh, I never really give my opinion without having the, the facts to back it up. It's interesting. I never thought about that distinction. Or, that I never give my point of view without having a fact, the facts to back it up. So I, I think there's a difference between point of view and opinion. I think someone like Sean Hannity does opinion. I do point of view. I guess that's, that's a great segue into, uh, you know, one of your most famous moments on the show. In 2018, you came out and said, uh, the president is a racist, uh, which right now, you know, we, we, that's right now part of the lexicon, but at the time- so that was not opinion, that was point of view. And just give me a little backstory on how that got there, because that was, you just, boom, you just laid it out there. Well, because that was Donnie, uh, I don't know if you remember, that's when the, the president of the United States reportedly called yes. uh, African countries, shithole shit countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he had previously called black NBA players sons of bitches. Um, he had previously said, what do you have to lose? He had previously uh, established a Muslim ban. Um, he had said Mexicans were rapists. He said the former president of the United States uh, was um, not born in this country and was African and was a Muslim. There's nothing wrong with being Muslim. But, you know, for s somehow he thought that would somehow impugn the reputation or the image, uh, tarnish the image of the former president. He had said very fine people on both sides when it came to Charlottesville. Um, he had uh, been sued for housing discrimination with his father. So you had, had you, tried you had, to. You had a, you had I'm, a, I'm giving you the you, evidence. You, you had a certain a do, a dossier to, to back you up. Obviously, well, I, I'm just I'm making a point because when people say people said, "Oh, Don Lemon's giving his his opinion about the president. Why is why is your opinion so important? Or, or why does it, your opinion matter that the president is racist? It wasn't my opinion. It was facts. And when we and when I had the conversation with my producer about that, I said, "Why do we just keep? Why do? Why does everybody in this?" business skirt around the issue instead of calling this president what he is. And that's racist. Uh, we'll say, you know, I used to say he was racist equivalent or racist. No, not racist equivalent. Adjacent. Racist adjacent yeah. is what I would say. And then finally, I just said, well, you know, we 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 were one of the first people to call out his lies to say the president was lying when other people would say, well, he's being hyperbolic or he's um, he's misrepresenting the truth or, you know. And so I said he was a liar. And then finally, I had to say he's a racist because that's the truth. So that's the difference between opinion and point of view. And that's why I said it, because the evidence is there. There's no two sides to that argument. Yeah. You think any chance he's a transactional racist, which in some ways one could argue. You know, and I, I've known him for a lot of years before. And you can, it can be both. Yeah. You can he, be he can he can have uh, some bias about people of color, like, you know, the whole idea of him not even want, not wanting black people to count his money. He wanted the Jewish guys to count his money, yeah. Yeah. which is a stereotype for both black people and Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Jewish people are good with money. Yes. Right. Black people will steal it. Yes. So uh, <laughs> is that transactional racism? I think that's unconscious bias. Um, um, that's a little, you know anti-Semitism and, you know, racism on uh, against black people. Um, yes, I think he's a, he can be a transactional race. I think he's a transactional person. Yeah, I think he's as but, a sociopath. I think everything but, is transactional with him. But deep everything. down, I do think he's racist. And that, and that, you know, just because he's had a black girlfriend doesn't mean that he yeah. doesn't have racist quali qualities or tendencies or what have you. That's a great or black friend. That's a great segue for, for, from you. But one of the quotes from my book, and I, and I love this, and we're going to obviously talk a lot about race. And, and, and you said, white brothers and sisters Pocket that, but I'm not a racist card. I don't want to hear about your black girlfriend in college or your black postman to whom you gave fruitcake every Christmas or that black comp and lit teacher who totally like rocked your world. It doesn't matter if you are a racist or not a racist or anti-racist. Our society is racist. So as a white guy who I don't think I, there's a, I, I think there's a little piece of racism in all of us where we, we don't, it, it, I guess, let me ask you a question. If I look at you and I see a black man first, I see you, I see Don Lemon and I see a black man and I, I am noting your race. Is that a form of racism? I would see you well, as- Well, um, no, I don't think that anyone wants their race or who they are. Um, but I, I see I it, think, but I see I, it. I, I see don't it. want their race. Yeah, but, but if you identify with me, I mean, if, you, if that's the first thing you see, then I, I don't know. I mean, it's the first thing you think. I, I would say the first thing I see when I see Donnie, quite honestly, is not a white guy. I see, um, you know, this- a handsome um, silver fox. 
I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I, no, I see I'm, you I, also, but I'm, but I'm yeah, conscious. But I, I, I'm trying to, trying to yeah, do it. I'm conscious I, of your race. I, yes, I know that you're a white guy. I don't think you would want to erase that. Just like you don't want to erase. Look, Donnie, let's be honest. For you to look the way you look at your age, you work. I mean, you're a good looking man. Thank you. Right. As you and are so, too. And, and right. And you went, you got a haircut because you want people to know that you yeah. got, you got a great pair of glasses yeah. because you want people to see that you wearing a great shirt because you want people to see that you don't want who Donnie is a race. And part of who Donnie is, is being a white guy. It's the same thing for me, yeah. but I don't want that to be the sort of. It's not, the oh, it's not a thing. definer. I, I guess. Right. I, I, it's not a defi- we still if it's s- a definer. Yes. I guess it's the difference between me and my kids where I genuinely, but you know, I saw Obama as our first black president and I, I saw yeah. a black president and I loved it. And it, he my, was their my, first president, you know, and they don't see that. They see him as their president. My, my kids really don't see color where my, I guess my point is the most evolved of us of a certain age who are, we consider ourselves woke are not as woke as the kids coming up today. Yeah. And that whole idea of what, like some people, I actually whatever that means. So, yeah, right. so woke, they need a nap. You know yeah. what I mean? It's yeah. like, okay, give me, give me a break. <laughs> Um, no, I'm serious. And everyone thinks like, as you know, my book is not about wokeness. The whole concept of fluidity that we were talking about, I think it's the same thing with, with race. So the, I, I think I remember in that conversation that I had uh, recently moved from Atlanta and I was working with um, Jonathan and I said, you know, my neighbor's kids who were in their teen, well, teen, they were in their teen years. One was in junior high school, one's in high school going to college. And they had, um, the girl had had girlfriends and boyfriends, right? And mm-hmm. so and that, the same thing about your kids. Like they, they know the difference between in genders that one is a male, one is a female, but they're also, they may be even fluid in their sexuality as younger people are. They don't like to define themselves as gay or straight. It's the same thing with with black people or anybody else or an Asian person. I want you to see my beautiful blackness and who I am. I don't want you to erase that, but I don't want that to be a definer. And so I think your kids have grown up in a world pretty much where Obama was probably the longest serving president other than Trump than they had known. And so they were used to Obama being the president, mm-hmm. but that didn't mean that they didn't see his blackness. Mm-hmm. It just didn't matter to them so much. And it wasn't a definer to them. And that wasn't the first thing they saw when they saw him. As my mom, who is a woman of a certain age, if I say, she'll say, oh, that lady's hair is beautiful over there. And I'll say, well, which one are you talking about? And she'll say, oh, the white lady. And I'll say the lady in the red shirt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it just, you know, so, you know, it's, I think it's generational, but I think it's something that we need to, we need to think about. I don't want anybody to erase my blackness. I want you to see my blackness, but I don't want you to identify me only with that or discriminate against me or have some stereotype about me because of my blackness. And yeah. I think it's the same thing with any other Probably ethnicity. So. Yeah, talking about and any other, se- you know, sexuality, gender, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Talking about your mom, you talked about early on in your career, you would call her every day. You talk about this in the book and let her know that you were okay. All right, I want to talk to you guys about Bambi. And uh, he- here's what it comes down to. And when I say Bambi, it's B-A-M-B-E-E. Look, running a business, HR issues can kill you. Wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor relations, and HR salaries aren't cheap either. An average $70,000 a year. But Bambi, that's B-A-M-B-E-E, was created to specifically help small businesses. You get a dedicated HR manager, craft HR policy, and maintain your compliance, all for just 99 bucks a month. With Bambi, you can, you can change AR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, real-time chat. From onboarding to terminations, they customize your policies to fit your business and help you manage your employees day-to-day, all for just $99 a month. Month to month, no hidden fees, cancel any time. You didn't start your business because you wanted to spend time on HR and compliance. So go get Bambi at Bambi.com slash Donnie right now to schedule your free HR audit. That's Bambi.com slash Donnie, B-A-M-B-E-E dot com slash Donnie. If the 24-hour news cycle leaves you feeling like you know everything but understand nothing, you need to listen to Deep Background, hosted by Harvard Law School professor Noah Feldman from Pushkin. In each episode, Noah interviews an expert or policymaker to explore the historical, scientific, legal, and cultural context behind the headlines. Check out recent episodes that explore pandemic parenting, whether cryptocurrency is an asset, hate crime laws, Amazon's role in wealth disparity, and even Britney Spears' conservatorship. Listen to Deep Background wherever you get your podcasts. Talk to me about the talk that you got as a young black man that I never got as a young white man that we that we hear all, all the time about. Give, give, take me, give me the exact conversation over the early on that as a young black man, your mom worried about your well-being every time you went out, she talked to you. 
So um, it wasn't just the talk that I got just for, you know, you know, around driving and policing. It was a talk Well, you, you know, um, you know, people were my my white friends were dyeing their hair and they were doing mohawks. And my mom would say, you can't do that as a black kid. It's just not that's not going to you know, that's not going to serve you. It's not going to get you anywhere. Um, people are just going to attack you and make fun of you for that. Now, today, maybe a different world that you, excuse me, that you can do it. Or, you know, it, you can't you can't be out there getting DUIs like the white kids. Mm-hmm. You can't be out there drinking like the white kids because you're going to go to jail and you'll be under the jail. And it's right. You'll get caught up in the criminal justice system and you won't be able to untangle yourself from it. But the white kids will be one because they're white, two because their parents probably have money and some influence and because of the way the system treats them. Mm-hmm. Uh, three, when you're out driving our cars, which were usually beautiful cars, Lincoln Continentals, you know, back in the day. Cadillacs. My first car to, that I drove to high school was a Cadillac. My second one was a convertible. Mm-hmm. The third was a VW Beetle because I had to pay for it myself. <laughs> um, but um, when you're out driving this car, our car especially, you are going to be the target probably of police officers. And if you are, you must conduct yourself in a certain way because we want you to come home at night. And when you're out using this car, we want you to be responsible and extra careful so that Police don't have the opportunity to pull you over. And so those, those were the talks. And if they do pull you over, you take the keys, you put them on the roof, and you put both hands out of the window so that yeah. you don't become a victim of police brutality. And you say, yes, officer, yes, sir, or yes, officer, yes, ma'am. And that's what I was taught as a kid. You know, you, you talk a lot about it growing up in Baton Rouge and your grandmother's influence and your mom's influence. And I was very moved when you were talking about your your grandmother telling you about how they kept her literally, you know, figuratively and literally from voting by what they did. Talk to me about that story about how they kind of stole her vote in effect. So when I was a kid, um, I didn't I never realized that my grandmother couldn't read until I started reading. So I would do um, my grandmother was my best friend growing up and she would take me everywhere. She looked white. People had you know, they didn't know they didn't know what degree of whiteness it was because her mom was mixed and her dad was white. Uh, and so my grandmother would be walking around with me or, you know, we'd be on the bus or, you know, going to, to shopping or at a lunch counter or what have you. And people would be like, what is that little black kid doing with a white lady? Like they had no idea what was going on. So I didn't know my grandmother. She was like my protector and, and, and best buddy because she was back then, you know, they call them nannies now. Back then she was just my grandma who was mm-hmm. my babysitter. Um, so when I was learning to read, I would try, I would sit around my grandmother's kitchen table and I would try to um, do my homework. And if there's something I didn't know, I would ask my grandmother. And then qu- quickly I realized that my grandmother couldn't read. And so she would tell me all of these stories about growing up and, you know, boy, I wish I had it like you. And finally, once I, you know, realized that she couldn't read, um, she started opening up about these stories about her past and, and why she couldn't, why she didn't go to school and she didn't finish school and how tough it was. My grandmother had a fifth grade education. So when I used to get my homework assignment with the, um, we would have a word list. I don't know if in your day, if you had that, where you yeah, had to yeah, learn yeah, yeah, certain yeah, yeah, words. Different words yeah. And so, um, in my day, I, I'm only like six, seven years older than you, you motherfucker. Go ahead. I, right. <laughs> no, I thought even you were younger. Even though you I looked you 10 were years younger. younger. <laughs> I, I thought you were younger. Maybe they had iPads <laughs> when you were, when you were your age, when you were growing up. So um, I, my, I would go over the word list with my grandmother, and we would have we had these Dick and Jane books. My books were, you know, look at um, um, here. Here are Dick and Jane. See, and they're playing in the park. See, Dick run, run, Dick run. You know that kind. Of, mm-hmm. That's what I learned. And so once I, uh, my grandmother started to tell me these stories, and I realized that she couldn't read. I made it my mission to teach her to read. So we would. So she would be sitting there with me doing my homework or doing her chores and cooking. And then I would make her sit down as this little kid in first grade and go over my word list with me so that she could learn to read. And then I would read with my grandmother to help her learn to read. And so we were sort of in this classroom together and she would tell me these stories about voting. She said, oh, and you know, she stories about everything. She told me about boyfriends she had or experiences she had, but then she would talk about voting. Uh, I remember one story and she said, oh, and we would go to the polls and you wouldn't believe it. Um, where I, you know, we would get there and the white people would be waved in. Oh, hey, Mr. Henderson, come right on in. But for me, they would say, you know, how many um, bubbles in a bar of soap? How many jelly beans in in the jar? 
And there were, you know, these, if you look back during the day, there were these tests about, you know, draw a circle, put a line in the middle and do all of these weird things that they would do for black people. And they, some of them would actually have to pay in order to vote. So as a young kid in first, second grade, as I'm learning to read, my grandmother would be sharing these stories with me as I'm, as, as I'm learning to read and I'm teaching her to read as I get better at reading. Incredible. Incredible. But I want to get to the kind of the, the, the genesis of the book. And you know what else when I realized it too, when we would go shopping and I would have to count the change for her or, you know, to, in in an exchange for money and how much money she should pay and how much money she should get back. Um, that was also, um, uh, quite opening and a lesson for me. Beginning of the book is, is, um, you like the rest of us watch so painfully a public execution of George Floyd, uh, and, Take me through the moment where you just walked into the next room and, and started writing and then you gave birth to this is fire. This is the fire. Uh, I, I just, re- I remember watching it and it was horrific. But the, uh, I, I remember the first time I saw it, I just cried. I just watched it with my mouth agape and I had to close the door because I couldn't really take it. Um, and, I, it wasn't immediately that I sat down and started writing. I tried to figure out what you to do. Start to write a, a, a note to your nephew, yeah, which is like Baldwin yeah. starts. Right? So, right, which is Baldwin starts yeah. um, the fire next sure. time. A letter to his nephew yeah, on the 100th right. anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so um, I was sitting at home in quarantine reporting this very heavy story. Um, some days I would, most days, Donnie, I would go to two, I would drive two hours into the city and back so that I could spend time with my partner because my partner wanted to be in Long Island. And so I had to compromise. You know how that is when you're in a relationship. So I would drive two hours into CNN and then two hours back. Or there were days if there was unrest and it was unexpected, I would, um, I would do it from my home studio. <clears throat> but I remember one of those days I was at home uh, and reporting from my home studio. And I said, I, I, I've got to do more than just sort of do the back and forth on the news and say, this is happening here and this is happening there and this is happening here. And I couldn't be with my family as most of us couldn't. We were all in quarantine. And, you know, how do you, t- and I said, what am I going to do? And I thought about the most impactful thing um, that had ever happened to me. James and that Baldwin. was, and holding this up is to those the James Baldwin book from 19- And this is my holding up the James Baldwin book. And you see all the notes and Wow. Whatever. And so this is one of my original copies. And that book was the most, had the most influence on me of race and sexuality, especially race, than any other book, especially race. Baldwin did as far as sexuality. This book doesn't talk about it. But um, and so I said, I was feel I, I wanted to say something to my nephew because I felt guilty about the world that they were about to inherit and that the world that I was giving them to inherit, that I hadn't done enough. And so I sat in my room with the, the, this computer on my lap, uh, and I started this letter to him, like James Baldwin started to his, to his nephew. And uh, what came out of it was a tribute to him and um, a plea for him to embrace his beauty and his blackness with an ease that I wasn't able to master at his, at his age and even as an adult. And I, I wanted a, a better world for him in a place where it was acceptable for him to be uh, fully and freely whoever he was and wanted to be. It's a beautiful story. And it, just the parallels of, of your nephew and Baldwin's nephew. And uh, um, there are a few and, things. And, and at 13 years old, you don't call your nephew up or FaceTime and say, no. hey, Trishad, <laughs> I really love you. Because he's like, Uncle Don, you're being weird. I'm going to go back to the video game, you know? So I, I thought it was best to express it that way. You've had a 13-year-old. You understand. It. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but trust me, I do. There's, there's a few things that pop out of the book, a few lines that the press has picked up on and, and really kind of are so important to the book. And one is, say, we got the president we deserved in Donald Trump in 2016. And you talk about that. And that we also needed. As a matter of fact, I read a, a, a stat a couple of weeks ago. I was preparing for something that from a Washington Post, ABC News poll from 2018, I think, that one in 10 Americans think it's okay to have white supremacist neo-Nazi values. One in 10, not one in 100, one in 1,000. And my question is, yes, we have to deal with it. And the George Floyd thing has been a seminal term, turning point. But also at the same time, when, when we see the Nazis marching in Charlottesville and we see that, does that empower others, you know, the more we give yeah. the proud boys attention. So there's this kind of weird, 
Yeah. Two-sided coin okay. here. Okay, so here's the thing. So I said that, pre- that President Trump was probably the president we deserved um, because I think we were living in um, – uh, a fantasy land when it comes to race. I think we, because we had elected a black president that we thought we were in a post-racial society. I think most, if not all, black people in this country didn't never didn't believe that uh, and knew that there was racism openly, overtly out there. And then I think whites didn't realize just how it was lurking beneath the surface for them. So it opened our eyes. I think most people, especially me, would have preferred to have a different experience other than uh, President Trump Uh, But so so be it. That was the president we deserved. because I think we platform celebrity. We put celebrity over um, um, over over context, content, right? over content, over context, over um, importance, over competency. We put celebrity over that. We were brainwashed by, oh, this guy is uh, the celebrity apprentice. Therefore, he can run the country. What have you? Or he is, you know, we gave him. you know, some uh, sort of credit. We gave him a false credibility that we should not have have, have given him. Um, but I think that the Proud Boys and the neo Nazis who marched in Charlottesville needed to be seen. I think it was an important moment for the country that we saw that they uh, can march openly with khakis and and polo shirts and tiki torches and. Um, that it happens in in business uh, with people in business suits or business dresses or what have you, men and women, that it is it is out there and we just refuse to see it. Now, I think that it's good that they have been unearthed, uh, that they have been exposed, um, but I don't necessarily think that we should continuously give them a platform. I think you should bring light. I think journalism should bring light to dark places. But that doesn't necessarily mean continuing to platform them and give them a platform once you've exposed them. And I think that's a, I think the very same thing about Donald Trump. I think that once people show you that there's that uh, once they display bigotry, hatred, lies, um, misinformation, um, xenophobia, homophobia, um, anti-Semitism, um, Sexism, any of those things, to the degree that a Donald Trump does or a neo-Nazi or a bigot of that nature to that degree, I think that you, should, you don't have to give false equivalents to lies and truth, uh, to sanity and insanity. And so I, I think if you, if you expose someone when they, show, when they show you who they are, good. Expose them and then stop platforming. Ron, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about a little bit about your, your job at night being an anchor and a little different now than it's been the last four years. Uh, it <laughs> cer- certainly wasn't easy, but there was a uh, a clear path to go on. Uh, I mean, it was, there was this villain. I mean, if you were going to create a book, you had a villain, you had a Bond villain to play off of every night. And being that he, the emotional connection is there. And he was, it was such a story of right and wrong, good and evil, um, that it was, I don't want to say easy to do news every night, but- it was certainly more compelling to watch and I would say to build a sausage a little bit more baked in. Talk to me about life now post-Trump. Now, we're not post-Trump, unfortunately, but a post-Trump presidency where we don't have that focus. And we hated the focus, but the focus was there whether we hated it or loved it. Well, I don't, I don't think it was easier then. I think, it's, I think it's actually easier now to do the news because we can actually do the news. Um, and we can actually talk about uh, about real issues about, about issues, about, um, um, uh, things that are important rather than someone trying to change the news cycle, uh, rather than someone just being sensational, rather than the, the toxicity that's out there in the country, than just racism. Actually, we can talk about, think now that we can talk about substantive things. Yeah. We had an, uh, an antagonist or a protagonist, however sure, you want right, to yeah. put it. Um, and I think that, you know, that made for great television, sort of reality style television. But after a while, that reality style television and reality style news um, is empty. It's empty calories. And I think that America, in, a lo- in large part, realized that and wanted to get back to substance. And quite frankly, now are uh, quite satisfied with boring. Um, emotionally, yeah, here, here's the thing. We, and I, I think I always talked about the Biden brand, that the calmness was going to, and the boring thing going in was going to be an asset. 
But yet in the business, and you are in the business, you're in the business of news, but there's an entertainment quotient, there's an engagement quotient. It's not as much must-see TV. I mean, when you say people want substantive, they want, no, they don't. They, I mean, the numbers prove it. I mean, this is just every, every news network is down since Trump. It was a story that it was the news every night, but there was a story to work within. And like it or not, it's not as, it feels better and we want it. And I, and I don't, you, you said in one morning, I think it was your Kara Swisher interview that, you know, I don't care if my ratings are one tenth, you know, Trump is gone and that's a better thing. But it is something to wrestle with as you're putting on two hours of live television every night. It is something, but I mean, listen, I, it is something to wrestle with. And let me tell you, I will let the news executives figure out how to deal with the ratings going down and all of that. That's, that's not my concern. My concern is to inform the American people and to be as engaging as possible in order to do it and to be nimble and to, um, to try to figure out how to make it more interesting and get more people to tune in. Okay, fine. I can do all of those things and still um, be uh, informed and not inundated with BS. So, um, you know, do it's actually I'm, I'm actually more interested and more um, tuned into what I'm doing every night than I was during Trump, because I knew every night during Trump, it was like some iteration of Trump did this, Trump sure. did that, Trump did no, that. No, no, you, 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 it's a lot more heavy lifting now, without crazy. question. I'm yeah, not but, surprised. but now I can I can talk about, well, what is in this package yeah. for the American people? What are we actually doing with infrastructure? Instead of just having an infrastructure week where Trump is sitting on an 18-wheeler and going, <laughs> beep, 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 <laughs> honk, honk, honk. There's, we're actually talking about policy and how much money we're going to put towards infrastructure and what we consider to be infrastructure. Is it traditional streets, roads, and bridges? Or is it infrastructure that has to do with Wi-Fi uh, and 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 um uh, our, the pipelines that fuel our homes so that you don't end up with what happened in Texas. I think that's much more informative for the American people. Are people as engaged? No, because the drama is not there. And that's but the, the word, I guess. The, the, drama, there, yeah. the drama will come back with, with something. Unfortunately, the drama came back with, you know, the George Floyd verdict. Ratings were high. Unfortunately, the drama came back when there was an insurrection on Capitol Hill. Yeah. The drama will come back periodically, but it's not sustained drama that is draining to the American people and is ultimately bad for our psyche. So I'm here for it, whatever that means. And then so I'll have to figure out, is it, do we, do I build on my streaming, as you called it, brand, my streaming content brand? Do I build on my, as we call it, um, Jonathan Wall used to call it, instead of, you know, having the drama about, you know, uh, palace intrigue at the White House, do I, do I lean into my M McNeil lemon? You know, McNeil Lair, right, right, right. I got jo it, I got Jonathan McCall, and he says, <laughs> you know, Don, when we do this McNeil Lemon, where you actually sit around and you go in depth, like the ratings really go up. And I say, yeah, because I'm, I think I'm kind of a smart person. I sound like Trump now. Um, and I just, you know, I'm, it, I don't just have to do drama or, or social issues. Um, I can actually do policy. And so we'll have to figure out how to do that. And I think we will. Everyone knew, Donnie, and you knew this, that once Trump left, that the ratings would go back to normal. Sure, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it, a, it, the it was, show. It's, the show it was it, candy. The it, circus it, wasn't there anymore. That's it. Yeah, question. And, but it'll come. I mean, listen. Maybe the guy's going to come back in 2024. Maybe we'll have the drama again. I hope I, not. I don't see that. But we'll uh, see. Along those lines, or explain. The you don't see that. Well, he, here's why I think he's not. He's he's not. He's not electable. Here's why I don't get about the Republicans. And maybe you can help me out with this a little bit. Forget. And I keep saying that. If I was taking over the Republican Party and I wanted to rebrand them and I wanted to try and move Trump out of the way, I wouldn't even make it about a moral imperative because they don't they don't see that. They, they don't see right from wrong. I make it about winning and losing that right now the numbers are he can't win. He, yeah. You know, he basically gets 75 percent of the Republicans, two percent of the Democrats. He, he lost before the insurrection that forget whether you like Trump or don't. It's a losing proposition. This is what I don't understand about, you're, you're, you're holding your finger up, what? Unless they steal it by Unless, suppressing the vote and gerrymandering, which they're doing now. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if he's electable or not. Uh, he can fuel enough rage and uh, false aggrievement and um, um, white aggrievement, right, that... Uh, it allows state legislatures to have the power to be able to steal elections. 
You said there's that one spot that hit it. I, I, and I've said this on there a lot of times that other than the people who think that Donald Trump is was going to put more food on their table, and once again, they don't always have the moral imperative. I believe that there was some form, and we're drifting back into race again, some form of racism in any vote for Trump in that, not necessarily that you were hard racist with a, with a white hat on, but it was kind of like, just let's keep things the way they are. It's making, it's yeah. getting a little... A little too even around here, and it, you know, and, and it's like a, a, a lot of my friends, frankly, that I, some of my ex friends, and some people that I, I, I got into su- such contentious fights about because that was at yeah, the fucking core. Yeah, it was. It was maybe it was an extra two percent on their taxes, but it was at their fucking core. It was no. It's not like I don't like black people, but I like I like I don't want to even things out any more than they are. I think things are just fine the way they are. Yeah, what I call the soft phrases, but I think. If you pulled the lever for Trump, that was a part of the DNA right there. Yeah, well, it is because you don't prioritize racism. And, and what does that make you? If you think that, as you said, 2% uh, on your taxes, is that is that more important than marginalized people? Is that more important or than democracy. civil rights <laughs> or democracy? Yeah. So, um, you know, and I people get upset all the time and they say, well, you know, not all Trump voters are racist. Okay, well, I'm not going to. Um, but you ignored it. And if you ignored racism, if you ignored the bigotry, then what does that say about you? I'll let you answer that question. That's what I say to people. But Donnie, I mean, quite frankly, I had to, I've lost a a lot of people who I thought were friends. Uh, a lot of people I went to college with, I went, you know, I grew up in very red Louisiana. Uh, and I just, I couldn't anymore because I, I, I had to take them off the text chain. Uh, I don't speak to them anymore. Uh, because of they lost their minds. They stopped believing in, they stopped seeing the humanity in other people, except for white people. They stopped believing in truth. They lived in an alternative reality. And the proof of that, the culmination of that was the insurrection that happened on Capitol Hill, because all of those people who went into the White House Uh, And who are now coming on television saying, oh, you know, Fox News made me do it or whatever. The president made me do it. He told me that's how all of my friends who were hard Trump supporters sounded just like Trump, just like those insurrectionists. You know, I want to I want to do a little branding work on a few different things. I want to ask you a few things. First, tell me about the CNN brand. You, 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 you've said it's an iconic brand. What is the CNN brand? Now I'm going to put you to work. Now we're going to do the, some branding stuff. What is the CNN brand? What's the uh, CNN uh, brand? It, it is uh, CNN brand is facts first. The CNN brand. CNN is. Whoa, the- whoa, 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 whoa! Let let let's time out with that. CNN, which has had tremendous success with with you in the night and and and, and Chris at night and, and Anderson, who it is point of view, as you said, okay, but it's it's not all just facts. You start, I guess facts first, You can, but that's not, that was the older CNN. As a viewer, as a champion of, of cable news and an avid watcher and understanding, it's point of right now, it's point of view first. Yeah, no, we didn't say facts had to be boring. We didn't say you, <laughs> we didn't say that if you're going to present the facts that it must be boring because I can sit here, what is this? This is a uh, my Saturday paper, I can't see anything, but let me, let me just give you something. Okay, so if I say um, the disappointing jobs report released Friday by the Labor Department is posing the greatest test yet of President Biden's strategy. So that's how you read a newspaper. So if I'm on television, I'm going to go, listen, you know what's providing the greatest stress of the president's strategy? It's the disappointing jobs report, everybody. Mm-hmm. But and you, so, if you, because you do it with animation, because you're animated view, about and it, and point of view, and point of view, it doesn't mean that you're not giving the facts. Okay, it's the same thing that you get on uh, the when, on the front page of the New York Times when you analyze. Something. So I would say so, then it's it. I would challenge the brand that it's facts with a point of view as opposed to just facts first, because you're okay, you're leaving out a big part of the sausage there. That's you know. fine, but I said first. I didn't okay. say all. Okay, all right. So it's. I think it's facts first. And I think it's it is an evolving brand um, that is. Uh, I think it's the most relevant news brand in the world, broadcast news brand. Certainly in the, the world. most iconic, without question. Yes, Not even question. and most iconic. And so um, here's the thing about CNN. It's not real. And I know that you, you know, work, I think you have a contract with another network that you're on another network. I, I'm on, I, I, I pop up yeah. from time to time on MSNBC. Okay. 
Uh, and listen, I, I have great respect for MSNBC. Mm-hmm. I love the folks over there, as you know. I, I you know, I love Rachel. Um, I, 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 I love Joe and Mika. Like I, I've watched him almost every day. Yeah. I watch uh, Rachel. Um, so what I will say is that um, it's not real, and it is what, not what, what, a what's fact. Not, what's not real? Anything, unless CNN says it. Right. If there, if there's something is happening in the world. And until CNN says so, it is not so. And even when I worked for another news brand, it was the same thing. Has CNN reported reported it? But even out in the world, unless CNN says it, it's not. So that's the, the power of CNN. It is the biggest news brand in the world, the most iconic and the most trusted. Yeah, that's I, I, I would give it the most iconic, the biggest, the most trusted as people go in, in crises. I don't know if we're at the point anymore where if CNN doesn't say it, it doesn't. I, 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 you might be somebody who's inside the factory there. Somebody who's outside, I'll, I'll, I'll challenge you. I want to do some branding. I'm going to throw out some things, and I want you to tell me. Instant credibility, Don. Instant credibility. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. I'm an MSNBC guy, so I got to carry the flag there, you know. Um, I'm going to throw out some things, and I want you to tell me as a brand what they stand for. You can use one word. You can use a thought and just what you think the brand essence is, okay? Black Lives Matter. The brand essence? Yeah. Seeing black people's humanity. Fox News. I, I think the, the, the name is wrong. It's not news. It's, it's propaganda. Jeff Zucker. The um, smartest news executive in the world today. I, I love that guy. I, I, I mean, so, you, you, you know, Jeff Zucker, he, some people he can rub the wrong way, but he is so fucking smart. It's, it's scary. And I yeah. hate to say this because if he's listening, he's going to have that <laughs> smug look on his face. But, but, uh, no. but if he, he's like me, if I, I say, if you, um, if you care enough, uh, I love it that if you, if someone cares enough about my point of view or what I say that it pisses them off. And I think Jeff is, um, similar, very similar to that. Chris Cuomo. Uh, Chris Cuomo is a, a, my first thing is like a big teddy bear. Like he, uh, he, he pretends to be this big, strong, tough guy. And he's actually not. I love that. He's Democrat. very vulnerable. He's very vulnerable. But that's not his, like, that's, you know, that's him not as a his, person, but his brand is not, is anything but that. Oh, his brand. okay. You ask, okay. Just brand, brand, brand. His brand is, um, I call them both sides Cuomo. I like that. Okay. Democratic Party. <laughs> the brand essence. Mm, this is just me. This is just you. I think they're weak. You know, it's interesting. I've always, I, I've used different words on the air for them that I've always said that they play, the other guys know how to play with brass knuckles and they, and that there is a, but I think with Biden in trust, they, they project a certain strength that they never, like had they gone in another direction, I, I mean, it, it would, had they gone, and I've said this on there, I took a lot of crap with Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, they would have lost dramatically. And, and But that's not what I'm talking about. I think that, I think that, and I should say they're bad at politics. Okay. I think they have great morals and they have great values. They, they're actually the party of, um, uh, uh, they're the moral, what was the thing that we used to say, the... I forget what it was. They're the, they're actually the family values. Um, oh, without party. question. You're right. But I think that they are terrible at politics and uh, I think they have to become more cunning uh, at politics and they should, they should try to figure out how to play the, you know, play the Jedi mind trick on their competitors. They, they don't do that. They're what, very predictable. What showed was the Lincoln pro was so brilliant about the Lincoln project is it was obviously for the Democratic side, but playing the way the Republicans played. It had yes, that like, and- knife that you put in there. It had that brass knuckle. I mean, it was, and it, they understood how personal stuff was. And it, they had the right, it was interesting to see that voice coming from the Democratic side. They're too nice, Donnie. Yeah, okay. We like yeah. that. Republican Party. Uh, wow. Party. Uh, liars. Lindsey Graham. Political chameleon liar. Tucker Carlson. Um, exploiter. Don Lemon. Truth teller. My friend, I appreciate <laughs> it. You are, what, what, what a wonderful time I had today. You are, and one thing for people out there is that they don't know, they see you out there as a professional, but that you are one of the nicest, warmest 
people you'll ever come aboard. And I hope, I, I know you've talked about maybe uh, uh, having kids. Uh, you would be a great dad someday. I hope, hope uh, you guys go down that path. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to another lunch at your house. I haven't been invited since that last time. Yeah, don't blow my I game understand. up next time, okay? I <laughs> And Donnie, it had nothing to do with you. You internalized that. I, so. I, I know, but somehow, I somehow Christy Brink, you know, she just probably wasn't into me. Period. And I, I no, need but to, you I didn't internalize it at the at the at the lunch. I think afterwards, when you're like, "Well, man, I don't have any game," then you start to internalize. Yeah, it. I just I just saw Christy running tonight. the other direction, so I had to come up with some excuse. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate it. Have a good show tonight, all right? Hey, Donnie, you're the best. Thank, Thank you, you so much for this. I appreciate you got it. it. Take care. Bye. I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to On Brand. I hope you got something out of it today. I um, hope you learned something a little bit about branding and might help you with your own personal brand. Uh, I really, really appreciate you listening. You can also see it on uh, YouTube and follow it anywhere that you get podcasts. And you please follow, rate, and review, whether it's Spotify, Apple, or any place you get podcasts. And we'll see you next time on On Brand. Hey.